Hello everyone, welcome to Baiju's exam prep and welcome to the big news. As we promised, we are bringing back some of our popular initiatives based on popular demand. From daily quiz to explained to Indian economy essentials to the big news. All these initiatives are coming back for you to help you prepare for the upcoming prelims examination. So we really hope you take the full benefit of these initiatives and if you're liking them, do support us by pressing the like button, share your comments, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. So let's begin with today's The Big News. Today morning, there has been a sensational development. At least on social media, particularly on Twitter, there has been a trending topic. This has been picked up by media outlets as well, and there are very strong reports that India's most wanted criminal and terrorist, Dawood Ibrahim, has been reportedly hospitalized in Karachi in Pakistan. While these are still unconfirmed reports, because officially Pakistan has not denied it, neither has it confirmed the reports. And there have been speculations as well, largely on social media, that Dawood Ibrahim has been hospitalized because of poisoning, which reportedly indicates an assassination attempt. So these sensational reports coming out of Pakistan, Right? They do raise a very big issue. Now, many of you might think, why is this topic relevant for UPSC exams? Let me tell you why. Under GS Paper 3, we have internal security as a very important subject. And under internal security, we are expected to study the linkages between organized crime, terrorism, and money laundering. UPSC expects you to cover this topic in detail because organized crime enables money laundering and terror financing and there exists an interconnection between these illicit activities. This poses a direct threat to our national security. So given that Daud Ibrahim has been one of the top international criminals, one of the most wanted terrorists, this development indeed becomes very, very relevant for us. So let us understand who was Dawood Ibrahim. What was his role in posing a threat to India's security? Dawood Ibrahim was born as Dawood Ibrahim Kaskar. He was born in Ratnagiri in Maharashtra in 1955. His father, ironically, was a constable, a head constable in the Mumbai police. His son would later go on to terrorize the very same police force as he rose up in, in the Bombay's underworld. He would go on to terrorize the city and commit serious offenses against the country. In the 1960s, he dropped out of school and entered petty crimes, local gang violence. He became a, a hooligan, a local small-time criminal and got involved in small-time smuggling. Because please remember back then, in the 70s, 80s, prior to India's economic reforms, India was largely closed to imports. Import of luxury items, precious commodities like gold, they were all largely restricted and prohibited. So from importing various illegal contraband material, rather smuggling them, that would be the right word, to smuggling gold and eventually smuggling drugs, narcotics and weapons, Dawood Ibrahim has done it all. He would get involved in gang violence, criminal violence as well, thus rising the crime profile in Bombay, in the Bombay underworld. In 80s and 90s, he would make a switch towards more professional transnational organized crime. And his gang has been popularly dubbed as the D gang or the D company. This is not just any small criminal outfit. It's a transnational crime syndicate. It's an organized criminal network with ability to operate across continents and across multiple countries. His criminal syndicate has been involved in narcotics trafficking, arms smuggling, in smuggling counterfeit notes, and of course in extortion and several other transnational criminal activities. Today, 
He has emerged as India's top wanted terrorist, as the most wanted terrorist. So let's look at some details. Let's look at the rise of Dawood in the Bombay underworld and how he made a switch to terrorism. Even though this is not directly relevant for the exam, his involvement in criminal activities exposes the linkages between organized crime, external state agencies and how they connect with terrorist organizations. So in the 70s, Dawood Ibrahim, through his criminal gang, would be involved in various illicit activities starting with extortion. They would threaten politicians, Bollywood celebrities, cricket stars, etc. Issue death threats to them in exchange for ransom. Those who wouldn't pay up would be ruthlessly executed by the henchmen of Dawood. They would get involved in land and property deals. As you know, Bombay real estate has always been a prized value and by meddling in land deals, in property transactions, in settling property disputes, the Dawood gang rose up in the Bombay underworld. Of course, there were many other gangsters and criminals, but Dawood rose to prominence. And as a result, gang rivalries went up. The gang violence between different gang members and leaders, the prevalence of contract killings or supari killings, where these gang members would take Suparis take payments or contracts to execute targeted personalities. So this significantly increased the crime rate in Bombay. It came to a point where Dawood largely controlled several ports along the coast of Gujarat and Maharashtra. Using this, he would go on to dominate the waters of the Arabian Sea, setting up linkages as far away as Iran and Pakistan and West Asia, particularly Dubai. His criminal network would go on to smuggle drugs, particularly Afghan drugs, as Afghanistan emerged as a major narcotic sub as part of the Golden Crescent region, especially after the rise of Afghan Mujahideen. Afghanistan became a hub of narcotics production under the guidance of Pakistan's ISI, Pakistani Intelligence Agency, would be directly involved in the criminal activities that was present from the Golden Crescent to the Indian Ocean. So from Afghanistan, Dawood Ibrahim would get involved in drugs and narcotics, smuggling and trafficking. These drugs would reach India, Africa, West Asia, Europe and even United States. So thus, his network expanded very quickly and became a global transnational criminal syndicate. Apart from gold smuggling, his gang would be involved in arms trafficking, in smuggling, weapons, explosives, etc. But this was not the biggest threat for India from Dawood Ibrahim. The biggest threat from Dawood Ibrahim came up later when he switched towards terrorism. When he created that nexus between organized crime and state-sponsored terrorism. This became a deadly fusion for India in the 1990s that would completely shake up India's security architecture. It all began with increasing communalization of Indian politics in the late 80s and early 90s. The Babri Masjid demolition and the Hindu-Muslim riots that followed created a wedge in the Bombay underworld where many gangs broke up and split apart on communal lines. Dawood Ibrahim would emerge as a leader sworn to take revenge for the riots, for the injustice that had happened to the Muslim community. And under this influence, he would be radicalized. His gang would be radicalized and they would automatically develop closer ties with Pakistan's intelligence agency, the ISI. Because Pakistan was always looking for such opportunities to deepen the fault lines in India, to bleed India through a thousand cuts. After meddling with the Khalistan movement, after sponsoring insurgency terrorism in Kashmir, this was a right opportunity that was opening up for Pakistan. The communal divide that had opened up created communal hotspots from where several youth could be brainwashed, indoctrinated, and this would further Pakistan's cause to wage a covert proxy war against India. So as Pakistan had already cultivated several anti-India terror groups, 
Now it just needed the logistical support. A logistical support through a criminal syndicate to smuggle drugs, weapons, explosives and funds into India which would scale the covert proxy war that Pakistan was waging against India. So the D company would eventually get dragged into this secret war between India and Pakistan. It began with the 1993 Bombay serial blast, the first major act of urban terrorism in India. The Bombay serial blast was seen as a direct retaliation for the demolition of Babri Masjid and the Hindu Muslim riots that followed. The involvement of Pakistan's ISI and Pakistani terrorists was clearly established in the attack and the logistical support for the attack and even the funds came from the D company. From planning to execution, from arranging finances to smuggling explosives including RDX, the massive quantity of RDX that was smuggled into India along with weapons and funds. This was entirely arranged by the D company. Pakistan's ISI had now sheltered Daud Ibrahim by 1993. Karachi became the operating base. Prior to that, Daud Ibrahim had fled India in 80s itself and shifted base to Dubai. Dubai and Sharjah. But after 1992, he shifted base to Karachi under ISI's protection. And from here, his criminal network would directly assist the ISI and the terror groups that Pakistan had created to target India. So with the help of his criminal network, they would smuggle explosives, weapons and funds into India that directly led to the 93 Bombay blasts. Hundreds of people were killed. This was one of the biggest terror attacks that India had suffered from. This would mark the beginning of pan-India terrorism, especially targeting Indian cities that was sponsored by Pakistani state agencies. So this direct state support from Pakistan clearly exposed the link between hostile external state intelligence agencies with organized criminal cartels and how they could use these networks to enable terrorist attacks against India. Dawood was also involved in illegal hawala transactions in money laundering, thus forming the perfect combination for the ISI. From easily moving funds through hawala channels to smuggling drugs, explosives and weapons into India, right? Dawood and his gang could do anything for the ISI. In return, the ISI would protect Dawood Ibrahim and provide shelter in Karachi and in other parts of Pakistan. Following this, Pakistan's ISI would further leverage Dawood's network to develop direct links between the criminal cartel and notorious terrorist organizations in the region, including Lashkar-e-Toiba, Al-Qaeda, jesh e mohammed and Hezbollah Mujahideen. Along the Afpak border, Pakistan had already created a fertile terror ecosystem by 1990s. The D company would be encouraged by the ISI to build close contacts with the Afghan Taliban, with Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, and as well as with anti-India terror groups such as Lashkar-e-Toiba, later jesh e mohammed and others. He would provide logistical support to these terror outfits, enable the smuggling and trafficking of Afghan drugs and play a pivotal role in Pakistan's involvement in state-sponsored terrorism. In fact, the United States went on to file charges against Dawood Ibrahim for his direct close links with Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. The US declared Daud Ibrahim as a specially designated global terrorist and pushed a proposal at the UN Security Council to get him sanctioned by the Al-Qaeda Sanctions Committee. So these were very big developments. So Daud Ibrahim is not just a wanted terrorist in India, but he is wanted by several countries. So because of the US initiative, the UNSC, the UN Security Council, through the Al-Qaeda Sanctions Committee, has listed Daud Ibrahim Kaskar as a globally wanted terrorist. And UN sanctions apply against him. The 1267 sanctions that requires UN members to curb his movement, to curb his access to funds, to curb his access to weapons, these sanctions through the UNSC applies on Daud Ibrahim. 
And it's not just that. Today, Daud Ibrahim is wanted by law enforcement agencies around the world. From India's NIA and CBI to the FBI in the United States and even by the Interpol. The CBI has raised a red corner notice through the Interpol, which still stands against Daud Ibrahim. If you look at NIA's most wanted list, the CBI's most wanted list, Daud Ibrahim is right at the top. Under the UAPA, the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, which is India's primary anti-terror law, individual terrorists can also be designated by the Ministry of Home Affairs. And Daud Ibrahim has been listed as one of the individual terrorists by the Home Ministry, as you can see here in this list. He joins the ranks of notorious terrorists like Masood Azhar, the founder of Jaish e Mohammed, Hafiz Saeed, the leader of Jamaat ud Dawa and Lashkar, Zaki U Rahman Lakhvi, one of the top commanders of Lashkar and one of the top planners of 2611 attacks. You can also see names of some top Khalistani terrorists. So, in this infamous list, Daud Ibrahim is listed as an individual terrorist under the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. So, this speculative report that has come out, which has gained a lot of traction, which has been reported by mainstream media as well, does bring attention to the question of Daud Ibrahim and his, his extradition or his arrest from Pakistani authorities. Because Pakistan has always refused to act. In fact, it has even refused his existence in Pakistan. Indian intelligence agencies, IV and RAW, along with Mumbai police, they have kept a close watch on Daud Ibrahim and his activities. We have repeatedly raised requests at the UN, at FATF, to ensure Pakistan acts against him. Indian agencies have tracked his movement, collected his addresses, his locations in Pakistan and shared this data with Pakistan and the, and the global community. Despite that, Pakistan has never acted and it has always refused his presence in Pakistan. Except for one instance in 2020, where the Imran Khan government was pressurized by FATF. Apart from that, Pakistan has never admitted the presence of Daud Ibrahim in Pakistan. That was the only instance where the Imran Khan government admitted that yes, Daud Ibrahim is found in Karachi. Apart from that, it has always denied his existence. You can look at this statement that India had issued in 2015. Then Union Home Minister Rajnath Singh had informed the Lok Sabha that Daud Ibrahim is a wanted terrorist and a transnational criminal who is designated by the UNSC Sanctions Committee. And there is also a standing red corner notice against him issued by the Interpol. So this obligates Pakistan to act against him. Given that India has shared a dossier with his name, with his details, with his addresses, Pakistan is obligated under international law as part of Interpol and as a UN member to not just impose the sanctions but also to arrest and extradite him to India where he is wanted for several criminal offences and acts of terrorism. So no wonder Pakistan has not responded as of now with regard to these speculative reports. So please keep track of these developments. See, Daud Ibrahim might, might have been hospitalized due to his illness as well. He's already uh, past his prime age. Or as reports indicate, he may have been poisoned. We don't know. Let's not get into the conspiracy theories. There is a wide buzz on social media because of late, there have been some interesting developments in Pakistan and in some other countries. A spate of wanted terrorists by India have fallen dead. The two under mysterious circumstances. They have been shot by masked gunmen. Some have been poisoned. Some have died in very mysterious circumstances. This has all given rise to a theory that India's foreign intelligence agency, RAW, might be running a covert operation hitting the most wanted terrorists in foreign soil. This is further substantiated, these conspiracy theories are further substantiated by the allegations raised by Canada and United States. Recently, the Canadian government openly alleged that Indian agents were involved in the assassination of a Khalistani terrorist. US also has pushed for a legal case where apparently Indian officials were involved in planning an assassination of a wanted Khalistani terrorist who is an American citizen. So these allegations by US and Canada further adds weightage to these theories that India might be behind these killings. In the last one year alone, more than 15 wanted terrorists by India have fallen dead and many of them in Pakistan. Several top terrorists of Lashkar and many other notorious groups have been killed. This could happen either due to inter-gang, inter-group rivalries or Pakistan might be bumping them off due to international pressure or there could be Indian involvement. 
Again, let's not get into that speculation. Let's set that aside. But let's look at the facts. Let's look at the role of organized crime in enabling state-sponsored terrorism. How Pakistani state agencies have used criminal syndicates like the D Company to wage this covert proxy war against India. So that is very important for our exams. Is that clear? So on this note, I would like to conclude my discussion for today. I hope you guys have liked the video. If you did, please press the like button, share your comments. Do let me know what you think about the role of Daoud Ibrahim and Pakistan in creating these security challenges to India. So that is it. Let's end the session. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. We'll see you on the other side.